Shall we begin? Is everybody <laughs> sitting comfortably? <laughs> Welcome to Journalism Media Week 2023. Um, I'm really excited about our panel today and thank you all very much for being here. I think what we'll do is just, um, you know, like we're back at school, if we go around and introduce who you all are, tell us what you do and then I'll, we'll have a little chat about what you did here and how you got to do what you're doing today. So Charlie, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Charlie Russell. I currently work at McLaren uh, Formula One team as a senior communications executive. Uh, I've been there around 18 months now. Uh, prior to that, I worked in football at Lincoln City for around five years. Um, yeah, it's just gone so quickly since I graduated. I think that was around 2018, 19. I've been saying I need to remember that year all week, <laughs> but I still can't actually remember which one it was. But yeah, like the time's just gone so quick and it's great to be back, obviously. I remember sitting here in the student's position all them years ago and seeing talkers and you've got to make the most out of it and ultimately it's a massive sort of um assist to be able to get you into obviously what you want to do and work out which area of whether it's journalism media whatever what route you want to go down so yeah been a bit of a whirlwind so i'm back thank you katie mm -hmm. hi i'm katie hasseldine i graduated five years ago um i did the ma journalism course and I work for BBC Radio 4 now um, on the Today programme and the PM programme as part of the Across the UK team. So I'm based outside of London. The aim of my job is to take the programmes outside of London and get some better representation from people in the north or well, anywhere outside of London. Um, so I work as a producer, um, a, a little bit of everything, to be honest. Uh, before that, I was a reporter and a journalist at BBC Radio Merseyside. So I have done local and now I'm in network. And then previous to that, I was in local TV. Uh, so I've got quite a wide range of broadcast experience. I've managed to pack into five years. Thank you, Eamon. Hi everyone, I'm Eamon. I work at Pentas People, who are a cyber security company. I do all their news coverage, podcasting, um, filming videos of the consultants talking about the recent attacks that's happened around the world. Um, I, gradu I graduated Leeds Trinity in 2019. I studied film and media. Um, yeah, and I also did a radio module where my passion for podcasting began. And then I did a master's in sound design where I built up soundtracks for radio podcasting learn behind the scenes um pre-production and pro-production and also um i did work experience with warner, warner brothers film studio um so i do really like to do video content as well on the side whereas i do podcasting radio full-time um, yeah thank you alex um hello um i'm alex and i graduated last year um since then um I've been a story researcher on the channel of also Pollyoaks. Um, I've been doing it for a year and a half. Um, so coming to a year and a half in December, but unfortunately not renewing my contract um, due to budget cuts, but I'm still looking forward to having some time off because it's just been hectic. Um, so, um, so I've worked with the story team and they come up with the storylines for the show. Um, and anything that requires researching, such as, um, for example, there was um, a cancer storyline recently where you've done an in-cell storyline. Um, and um, so it's just reaching out to charities and contacts and, um, and making sure that the storylines we tell are as authentic as we possibly can. Um, and um, it's... It's been really hectic. Um, you see the cast and crew coming every day. Um, I can't say what they're like, though. Um, but yeah, it's been really fun. Thank you, Otis. Yeah, I'm Otis Holmes, and I uh, work at BBC Newsround now. I graduated, I wish it was last year, in 2014. So it's a fair while ago now. Uh, but before that, I used to work at ITV Calendar, which is in Leeds and does like Yorkshire and Lincolnshire and spent a bit of time at ITV Channel, which is in Jersey. Um, but yeah, done a bit of everything, really. I used to present the morning bulletins at ITV Calendar, did a bit of reporting there, did a little bit of reporting in Jersey. Um, at the moment, I'm a 
journalist at Newsround, so you do a little bit of everything. So you'll do stuff for the website, you'll go out and um, film packages, um, go out and interview people. It's it's a nice bit of variety, really. So to start off with, probably something that everyone's always uh, thinking very much about at the moment is experience, work experience. You know, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? How can you get the experience? So what what is your advice? And, you know, speaking of your own individual experiences when it comes to getting work placements and experience in the field and really making that known to future or potential employers. Do you want to go first, Charlie? Yeah, sure. Um, I've always been quite a big speaker in terms of, I think work experience is one of the most important things any student can do in terms of obviously building your CV, but also it allows you as an individual to be able to decide what route you want to go down. So I sort of, um, prior to university, I did some work experience in like print media, uh, magazine and newspapers. So I realized that, yeah, it was cool. Um, obviously print media was sort of dying at the time, unfortunately, but obviously the digital age has come around, so that, that's good. But um, that's prior to university. Once I came to university, um, we did some radio placements, stuff like that. And it was only when I went to Halifax Town on a placement that I sort of worked out that I actually wanted to go down the like club media route and actually work for the organization opposed to being a journalist, if that makes sense. The journalism course itself is obviously a great course to go on because there's so many transferable skills that can be taken into so many different career lines. But um, yeah, during that sort of period at Halifax, it allowed me to do a bit of everything in terms of social media, um, press releases, writing match reports, interviewing people, doing video editing, stuff like that. Um, and ultimately that allowed me to sort of narrow down what I wanted to do and find my niche in terms of being involved in media and sports media. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no better advice, I don't think, than getting yourself out there. It doesn't matter how big or small the work experience is because ultimately you'll learn something. You'll also be able to create a bigger network by meeting people, I think. Um, I think it was Piers Morgan's talk said, no matter who, like, who you speak to, make sure you keep in the contacts. You never know where it leads. Obviously, he did the, the Ronaldo interview just off the back of knowing Ronaldo, basically. So, um, yeah, no matter how big or small the organisation is or also who you're actually keeping in touch with, whether um, it's a senior individual or even someone at entry level, ultimately everyone's got a career and you never know where it's going to pass and where that will go to. So just make the most of meeting people and enjoy it. That's probably the main thing because, uh, yeah, it will mean a lot to you. I think mentors are quite important as well, aren't they? Has anybody actually had a mentor in the industry that you sort of worked closely with or looked up to? Yes, I did. Um, so I've got like a, an official mentor now, but I've had a couple in the past. So I um, joined the John Schofield Trust, where you get paired up to someone else in the uh, in the industry. Um, and the man was Tim Smith. So he used to like be in charge of um, BBC in Yorkshire like I think it was like head of news at Look North um and we didn't speak for um maybe like three or four months into the year I think it was just really busy things had been going on but then kind of from that point we like anytime anything comes up at work I'll text him we've met up for coffees and stuff he's always like there as someone that I know has got experience and can kind of say you can kind of it, we know each other to the point where I can say look be honest Am I, being, am I a bit stupid here or am I overthinking this? Is this a good idea? Should I take this risk? And they, can, they can never tell you what to do, but they can give you advice and they might be able to put you in touch with other contacts and things as well. So I think it is very useful to have someone from the industry that you can kind of peck the brain, really. And how important do you think it is at the moment to use social media channels when it comes to networking and creating contacts and maintaining contacts and relationships within the industry? Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, uh, LinkedIn, that's a very good social media platform where you can um, connect with employers, employees from companies, get to know them, um, get to know the people that they work with. Um, yeah, keep con connecting with people, keep connecting with people. I'm sure all your lecturers tell you to connect with people all the time because that's how you'll get your foot in the door. Um, Alex, have you got anything to add to that? Um, not, uh, yeah, I think LinkedIn is also in, important because you can get um, job alerts and to also um, to look at, um, you know, I see the BBC websites, um, you know, regularly and see what drops or, you know, because there'll be internships or placements that you can go on and you'll have the opportunity to shadow people like 
Um, like on our state, you can have the option to shadow as a third AD on the floor, so you can pick up skills there, and hopefully when you graduate, you can um, get a job there. And also, I guess, to understand that brand and align yourself to that brand and business and you know, do your research, which we all know is really, really important. So, Katie, we were talking a bit before, weren't we, about transferable skills. And in, in fact, you know, you might be you might end up working with a great, fantastic job, but perhaps not doing something that you, you know, you really, really want to do. What, what can you tell us around your experience with that? Um, well, on the... I wanted to say something about work experience first. So obviously people will tell you to get work experience when, when and where you can. And sometimes it's not that easy to get work experience. Like companies, places are busy. Like sometimes they might not feel they have time to, you know, give you the time that you need to, to be able to flourish in a work experience role. But um, one thing that I did when I left uni, or well, actually while I was still at uni, was... Um, I really enjoyed video editing and I knew that I liked making videos and I, I knew I wanted to go into broadcast news. So I, it wasn't like a work experience, but I was using those skills outside of work and outside of university to make like, even if you're just making like vlogs or if you're just filming, I don't know, like a short sequence, like just use your skills. You don't have to get like paid for it or work experience. If you can put together a portfolio and you can say, like, I've made this, but so my first job in um, t local TV, I didn't have a show reel, but I had, like, I could show my editing skills and show that, like, you know, I can make things look and sound good. And that's one big part of the job when you're working in TV. So for, like, work experience, like, if you can't get actual work experience, just make sure you're using your skills in what you enjoy doing. Because if you enjoy doing it, then it don't feel like work and you know you'll hopefully you'll end up getting a job in it one one way or another um so there was that and then also with the like social media I think like I know people don't like Twitter and X or whatever it's called but that is where everybody is and I think if you if you're doing work that you're proud of you should share it on all social media like don't just stick to like LinkedIn is obviously good for connecting with people but like if you're following the right people or like make sure you you promoting your work that you've done and like tagging where you are and like I think it picks up on like algorithms if you've got pictures or videos that you've done so like it's like even now like I'll still if I go on a program and producing a program from say like Warrington I'll just take some pictures while we're there I'll say oh PM's in Warrington today and people engage with that and people will start to notice you so I think like make sure you're promoting your work across all platforms and people will just start to remember your name and then, so what was it? What did you actually ask me? <laughs> so we were talking before about um, different parts of the job that you feel comfortable with, yeah. and some that you don't, and missing the bits that you perhaps yeah. do want to do. Yeah. But I think it's patience as well, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. So I worked at when I worked at Radio Merseyside, I was reporting a lot, um, which I, I love reporting. Um, and then I got a job at Radio Four, and that doesn't involve any reporting, so I wasn't on air, and I was really missing it. But what I was doing was like working I was doing things in this job that was the same skills as before but it was just in a different role so I'm working with like presenters now that uh you know like when I think sometimes I think like five years ago when I was sat in here if I thought that I was going to work with like Evan Davis or Nick Robinson and I'd be producing his programs I'd be just like no I won't but it's stuff like that like you, you can take things from those people and and you, I'm still learning all the time because I'm working with people that have got so much more knowledge and experience than I have. And even though I'm not doing what like I really want to do, which is reporting, I'm still getting so much from this job I'm doing now that I know that when I do go back to reporting, I'll be better than I was before from what, what I'm doing now. So I think the point of what I'm saying is like just whatever experience you get, you'll always find something from it that you can apply in a future role, I think. And I think it's just important to like, even if you're not hugely enjoying something or you think, oh, what's the point? It's not gonna get me anyway. Like it will be, it will come in handy at some point. That's it. So um, a question to all of you actually. So how does your day-to-day -day life now compare to when you were actually studying here at Leeds Trinity University? Um, I know Otis, I spoke to you briefly before about a typical day for you at Newsround. Are there I any was similarities say, like, less between lectures, them and the year? <laughs> <laughs> I did miss a couple when I was here. Um, I think, I think I have like it's quite similar. Like I think 
when I was at, at uni, um, I was far from like the best student. There were some people who kind of get all the top marks and things like that. But when like a piece of work needs to be done, then you just kind of get on with it. And like, it doesn't really matter how long it takes. Um, you put your all into that bit of work at that, at that point. So if you had um, a package or VT or whatever to, to kind of put together for, for uni, and I knew the deadline was like, if I had a week to do it, then you just sit there and you, you do it, you fern bash, you make sure that you get the like the right people, you go out there, you spend your time like doing the edit or having a friend help you with the edit. Um, and then, I don't know, you, you just kind of do it at the time. And like now it's like, it's it's similar, like when work needs to be done, sometimes you'll have a long time and you can kind of think about how you can kind of put something together and craft it, but also, you know that there are other times where you just have to get your head down and kind of get on with it and you might not have time to kind of have a break and stuff but it's it's similar in that i think you know when you've got to just kind of get on with something and when you've got a bit more time to have a think and things so in that sense i think quite similar great thank you alex um so, so definitely the working hours <laughs> um <laughs> Um, so it's for, for for me it's nine to half five but I know the people on the floor the casting crew it's eight to six um, so it is relentless um, but it is rewarding and um, I think it I think it's it's fun it's something different to do um, it's not an office <laughs> I mean my job is an office job but if you're on the floor you know you get to see some of the action being filmed, you get to see the bloopers, you get to see who messes up the lines. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the the working hours and the the, the dedication, um, you, you definitely need it. Thank you. What do you think? Yeah, um, I agree with Alex, the working hours. My hours are eight till half past four. Um, so what I what a typical, a typical day for me is coming to the office, going to the studio, research, the biggest attacks that has happened around the world, start sort the scripts out, um, and then start the production with the consultants that I work with. So uh, big thanks to Ricardo for teaching me all the skills in script, write, script writing and video editing, and also to Darren. So I get to combine all the skills that Darren has taught me in radio production and Ricardo's taught me in film editing. So I'm really glad I get to do what I do, what I love every day. And I don't even consider it as a job because I, I just love what I do so I just think I think of it as something I love to do so not as a job what was it how is it different or how is it yeah how, how other it than what the similarities so, how does it compare being here compared to yeah. being in industry doing your day-to-day -day job so I've got a bit more money now <laughs> 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 so I can have nice things for my dinner um and I, I think like when I first got a job I was absolutely skinned and I think that's something you've got to prepare for as well. Like realistically, like it's not, it's not easy. You, you know, some days I'm like, oh, I don't even know if I've got enough petrol to get to work. I was just so skinned. But, um, you know, it's, it is worthwhile. Like you were saying before, it's don't feel like a job because I really enjoyed it. Um, but now, now I have got a bit of money. I'm, I'm, so I'm like, I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm a pop bitch. But what I mean, it's like now that I'm like, I feel like I've sorted my life out. Um, it's it, it, you, it's a lot more stress free, but like it gets an experience. Like, so I like to go all over the country with, with my job. So I take the programs on the road and stuff. And so what's similar about it is like, obviously, I'm still having fun. Um, and um, doing lots of editing and meeting lots of people, which is all the things that I love to do. So that's great. And then um, what I really love about my job now is, like I said, I get to go around the country, uh, meet different people, see different things I wouldn't normally see. Um, so I, I don't know if I really answer the question, but I just really enjoy my job. So, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'd say the biggest difference now is that I'm not going to quids in on a Monday because that was part of my like, uni schedule. I don't know if quids in still a thing or not, but um, that was something that, um, well, I've just joked about that. It was something in terms of like, it made me sort of realize that actually maybe time management is quite important. Maybe if you've got a, a Tuesday situation at eight or 9am, for example, maybe it's worth resting your mind the night before. So um, time management is probably the biggest like, weirdly different but same thing at the same time because obviously deadlines are so important as well especially 
in my line of work, like I'm preparing um, schedules, I'm organizing interviews with the media at races around the world. And obviously you're on different time zones and stuff like that. So to be able to obviously a, a university when you've got certain deadlines and um, you've got your schedule and stuff like that, you've just got to sort of know it inside out and find out what works best for you. Some people love working quite late hours because they want to get it done into the evening. I personally like to get things done pretty much straight away, get a first like V0 of it, get a bit of time to myself and then go back in with a fresh mind because ultimately then you'll notice things that you want to change or stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's something that it's, like obviously it's in a different situation, but obviously it's the same as when I was at university, I was um, working to strict deadlines because if then deadlines aren't met, then there's big consequences. So um, yeah, just I'd say that's probably the main thing for me. And before I move on to skills and attributions, when you were looking for a job, I just wanted to touch on something that Otis mentioned a minute ago. It's a bit of a, a bugbear of mine. You mentioned phone bashing. So I'm going to ask all of you now, not to put you on the spot, what percentage roughly of your job involves picking up a phone and speaking to people? Do you want me to start? Or? Yes, please do. Um, I'd say when I'm at the racetrack, 95% of my job is done through the phone. Um, you may, I don't know if any of you watch F1, but um, when they're in the TV pen at the end of the race or qualifying or whatever, you've obviously got about eight to nine TV stations with three different broadcasters there. So I'm rubbish at maths, hence why I did journalism. So however many uh, um, broadcasters there are there, for example. Um, while that's happening, there are other broadcasters with crews in the paddock. So for example, Sky will have Rachel Brooks in the TV pen doing one-to-one -one interviews. Sky will then also have their pundits standing in the paddock ready to sort of grab drivers and stuff like that. My phone is literally non-stop buzzing in the TV pen. So if you oh, I try to stay out of the camera, honestly, I don't want to be famous, but um, <laughs> you may see Pete, like the press officers on their phone constantly. And that is to be able to organize all them sort of on the spot interviews. You've got to be so reactive as well in terms of, for example, in um, my main friends gone blank in Brazil last week, Lando obviously had a solid weekend. So there's a lot of media interest for, for our driver. So I'm on the spot then using my phone to organize interviews here and there. Unfortunately, you, you can't accommodate everyone, so you've got to decline some as well. Um, and that's sort of the luxury of the phone in terms of obviously everyone goes on about screen time and how you need to reduce it and stuff like that. But in the working situation, it's so useful to have that portable, portable, I can't speak, portable device available to you because it's got your emails on it, it's got schedules on it, it's got pretty much everything a laptop can provide. And but, you've got to be confident talking to people that you don't know. Exactly, yeah. Like I've got, you'll have producers that you've never physically met in person back at base from, um, we'll use Sky as an example as well. Sky will have a producer based back in England as well as on the ground. And you may have people you've never physically met in person, but you've had to speak to them on the phone or text or WhatsApp or whatever. So, yeah, um, just if if you need a contact quick and, and to the point, use your phone. So. Yeah, it's vital. Katie, what would you say your percentage is of talking to people on the phone? To make anything happen, I'd say 100%. On Tuesday, we, well, yesterday we did a programme. We did it from Bradford, actually. And um, it was quite last minute trying to get, we needed two guests. We needed, we wanted to do something on community cohesion um, following like all the stuff that's happening in the Middle East at the moment. So we was looking for someone from the Jewish community and someone from the Muslim community to come and speak to us about how it's impacting them here. Um, and I think in like an hour, I must have made about 50 phone calls. And I was just like, try, just trying to get hold of anybody. So definitely to make it happen. And I think as well, um, knowing how to speak to people on the phone is really important as well. So like within the first few seconds when they answer the phone, I'll know what voice to do and like what to say. So I'll either up my Yorkshire if it's someone northern, <laughs> or if it's someone that sounds a bit posh, I'll do my phone voice. But I think knowing how to speak to people as well will they'll they'll decide whether they want to engage with you or not within the first few seconds. So I think we're quite like you've got to have that skill as well, being able to just communicate with anyone. Like, don't sound nervous. Don't sound like you've got to go in there. And you know what you want to say. You know what you want from that person. Um, and you've got to let like make sure they know that they, they can trust you as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, very important to be able to have those skills and be able to pick up a phone. Aidan, what about your job? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. Um, when I'm interviewing external guests that are coming into the office, connecting with them, and obviously, um, I think everyone will agree with me, it's easy to put words through on a phone um, than, than a message. So, um, yeah, the, interviewing the guests, um, telling them about the questions beforehand, what to expect, so they're not nervous when they come in. 
Thank you, Alex. Um, I've, I, I hardly make any um, phone calls. I normally um, would email a child or email a contact that you'd want to speak to rather than on the phone. Okay, and what sort of response do you get? Um, sometimes, sometimes I don't email back, and that's mm -hmm. fine um, because we don't do we don't end up doing the storyline. Um, but um, sometimes we do reach out to um, them on social media on Twitter. Um, so at the moment, if you do watch Holly Oaks, we're doing um, a queer conversion storyline of John Paul. Um, and so I've reached out to um, a BBC journalist, Josh Parry, um, who advised us on the story. And we got a response that way, which we were all pleased about. Thank you. Otis, what about you? I think it's similar to what Katie said. And like, it's a way of getting trust, isn't it? Before a, a piece, if you can kind of chat to someone and put them at ease. If someone's in two minds about whether or not they're going to kind of take part in, in an interview or be a part of something, it's easy to kind of say, no over an email or just ignore it and be like, oh, I didn't get it. But like, if you speak to them there and then you can kind of put them at ease, explain what it is that you're after. I think it's a bit easier to connect with them that way. Um, also, I think it's quicker and a bit more efficient. I think there's times where you could send about three or four emails back and forth and you still haven't really got to the, what you want out of that conversation. Whereas if you're just on the phone, like, right, look, this is what we're after. Uh, this is what we're looking for in the interview. If there's not been interviewed before, you can kind of explain how that's going to work, um, where it's going to go, how it's going to be a part of the piece. Um, you could talk through some of their answers. So it's also like a bit of a feeling out process as to like kind of what they're going to be like as, a, as an interviewee. Um, it works well with press officers as well. Sometimes it's a way of kind of checking that they've definitely got what it is that you're after from, from them. Although a lot of the time you'll speak to someone for like 10 minutes and be like, right, I want this, 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 and this, this is what someone said. And then they'll go, oh, can you write that down in an email and send it over? And you think, but yeah, I think it's useful. And I'll start with you as well, yeah. Otis, if that's okay. When we talk about graduate skills and employability, what do you think are the main skills are needed now to break into the industry from an employer's point of view? Well, I think now you've got to be so multi-skilled because teams are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I think like in the past, you might have been able to say, right, I want to be a craft editor. I want to be a craft camera operator. I just want to report. I just want to do this. But like now you need to do more and more and more, particularly like in like a, a regional level, you're seeing people go out and you're um, self-shooting stuff. You're then going back, editing it, voicing it, and you're kind of doing everything. So the more you can do, the better. Um, I think being hard working is probably one of the main ones. I think there's nothing worse than like if someone comes in on work experience and they're just like sat there on the phone and they're not interested, particularly if it's somewhere where you was interested in years ago and didn't get like a chance of it's a bit frustrating then because you kind of think that's a wasted opportunity for someone that could have kind of got stuck in. Um, I think just being like being human is a main thing, like, like being able to speak to people, also being able to read when when it's not a good point to pick someone's brain. Like sometimes if you're close to the deadline and someone's asking you like loads of questions, it's not a good point, but you can sense when it's like, um, when it's a little bit slower and then you can like, you can just kind of be like a sponge and kind of take in all like their experience, ask them advice and things like that. But yeah, if someone's about to do a live in 30 seconds and you're trying to ask them questions, it's not, it's not too helpful. So I guess that really extends to work experience and placements yeah. as well, doesn't it? Sort of get yourself in there, be as confident as possible, mm. bed yourself in and read the room, like learn to soak up the atmosphere and the environment. Yeah. Ask what you can do to help as well. Like there's some things where the cat, yeah, I think when someone comes in on work experience or someone's newer, like when you're then kind of that position above, you're sometimes you think, can you trust them to do to do certain things? And then the difficulty from the other side is you're like, you like you want to do something you want to help out but it's, it's like kind of like a difficult balance but there's so many things that you can do that might seem like nothing to someone that's worked there for ages like you could say oh, look can i transcribe that interview for you or can i i don't know can i make the tea i don't know like there's, there's still yeah. some things that you can that you can do and you can be helpful and then when it's a little bit quieter you can kind of pick the brains a bit more thank you alex what do you think um yeah, I think all of that and also um, sort of trying to get experience where you can, if there's an opportunity for you to shadow somewhere, you should take it because you can find something in a different 
department, um, especially with soap. There's so many different <laughs> um, departments. There's the scheduling. I think a lot of people don't realize um, that that um, because we film 260 episodes a year, um, and there's what 22 scenes in an episode. They all need to be scheduled, and so so that is effective for the cast coming in because we have a cast of over 50. So to make it effective for the cast coming in, um, so and that's you know something that you can pick up if you know if you've got you know a logical brain, <laughs> you can and put the jigsaw pieces together to do scheduling, and there's the production team, and um, it's it's really hectic. And I can think um, just yeah. To understand got, how it works, yeah. yeah. So whichever world yeah. you're working in, you've got to understand yeah. how that functions. Because um, even even if I'm not in that department, I will I will always learn <laughs> about all the departments. So you know, I can pick up the, those skills that way. Thank you, Eamon. What do you think are the most important graduate skills? Um, being passionate, uh, being reliable, organised, hardworking. They're all important skills you need to have and also important skills into what you want to do. So uh, I'm a content creator, so there's a lot of skills. There's script writing, there's editing, production, pre-production, post-production, podcasting, radio, there's literally so many things you can do into content creation. But um, I agree with you when, when what you said about scheduling, because scheduling, I do a lot of scheduling, being organized, because I am the only person that does that in my job role, content creating, and it does take a lot of time, a lot of hard work and effort to sort, to sort um, an episode out, like a lot of hard work goes into it. So you need to be dedicated, organized, passionate into what, what you're doing. Thank you. Katie? Um, I think because companies, especially the BBC, uh, employers are looking for people to be, like everyone's been saying, like, like multi multimedia skills. So, so you'll do your mojo training, um, TV, radio. But I think if you've got an idea for something, and it's not just being able to like, oh yeah, I know how to edit on this software. I know how to edit on TV software, or whatever. Like, it's going in and pitching an idea, but already having. So this is how we're going to do it for radio, and this is how we're going to do it for TV, and this is how we do it for social media. Like every each story mm -hmm. will need different treatment for different platforms, and I think it's not just the skills of um, like using the editing equipment and software. It's also the, the skills and the knowledge of how will this work? How can we tell this story in a way that it's going to be interesting and engaging for each type of audience on each platform? So I think um, thinking about the treatment of stuff as well. But I guess that kind of like just just think outside the think outside the box. Like be creative and stuff. Like it sounds a bit cheesy, but don't rush into anything. Um, spend a bit of time on you know look at how the how have other people done it in the past. Like oh, is there something that I'm missing here? I don't know. Just trying to. Yeah, think a little bit differently for for each platform. I think that's something that people will appreciate. You're saving people a job if you've got all the ideas. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Um, so just on like the individual side of it, in terms of a graduate going into a job or an application or whatever, ultimately you've got to be confident, but obviously there's a difference between being confident and being cocky. So you've got to be confident when you walk into the place that for that job interview that you're the best person for that job. And ultimately whatever that job is, you can then get your set of skills in terms of, for example, I'll use myself as an example. When I was at Lincoln City, um, a club in League One, you're doing a bit, like I said, about Halifax, you're doing a bit of everything in terms of, um, you're being a press officer, you're also doing a bit of social media, et cetera, et cetera. I 100% want to go down the press officer communications route. So when I was applying for my job at McLaren, I made sure my CV was the skill sets that relate to that specific job. So obviously, like I said, I've got social media experience. I did mention it on my CV, but obviously my core experience was handling press relations, writing press copy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think skill set wise, you can never have enough skills. So as the guys have said, like being multi-skilled is so important and so vital. And the course that you guys are doing is like the perfect course for that. Um, so yeah, just take them skill sets and then narrow it down and sort of find that niche area that you do want to work in. And then you can sort of turn your CV to then echo what the job wants and another thing i bought a bit of a cheat in cv writing i think i actually learned it here was um on the cv when it's got like the job um advertising about what the actual role is and uh, roles and responsibilities find get an example of that from the current job you have or the, 
where you've done at university or on placement or whatever because then it shows the employer as well that you're you've got experience in that specific area and that's what they're looking for so take that then go into your job interview with confidence and uh, just be yourself like obviously you've done so well to get here at university in the first place so it's just like a constant journey it's gonna be deep now but it's just a constant I love that be yourself, be yourself. Yeah. thank you <laughs> right on that note so who has some questions who would like to ask a question this is the mic so I don't think you're Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I would just like to ask everyone um, if you could give uh, a singular sentence, uh, each of you, uh, what you would like to uh, would have heard yourself when you was uh, in our position right now. Uh, maybe you didn't hear it yourselves, but we would like to hear what you would have liked to hear. Um, I'd say mistakes are okay. That's a bit of, again a weird sentence, but ultimately you learn from your mistakes. So. Um, especially in the position of being uh, a graduate or um, someone at university, it's the best sort of time to learn from their mistakes because, um, as, as the guys said earlier regarding mentorship, the people who are here as lecturers and also when you go into a job or whatever, they are experienced individuals who they're just a fountain of knowledge. So, um, yeah, I'd say learn from, learn from any mistake and mistakes are okay because ultimately it makes you as an individual in your position so much more sort of and confident because you think all right i made that mistake i've learned from it i know how to do it better next time and ultimately you're not going to repeat it because you've, you've learned your lesson and i don't mean that in like a really negative way i just mean it in a, a way that it's only an, ever going to help you develop as a, a career professional i'm trying to think of it in a sentence um so don't be um don't get like stressed out if you don't get a job straight away because every interview that you have will help you for the job that ultimately you'll end up getting. I have a list on my notes and my phone of every job interview that I've had um, as for graduate roles. And I think there's about, I've had about 25 interviews and out of all of those, I think I've been offered five of them. Um, and each interview that I had there helps me and I took something from it even if I didn't get the job and I'd be like back down like oh, oh when am I gonna get a job oh, I'm sick of this job whatever um but each I really and I do mean that like I took something from it and the feedback always ask for feedback from the interviewees as well because they will tell you where you need to improve or work on and then you'll end up getting the job you actually want and yeah I think um, I'd say show all your work don't be shy to, sh to show employers lecturers what you've done previously because your first podcast is not going to be the best your first film is not going to be the best but show all your work show how you've progressed um, because that's what employers look for they want to see what you've done before what you're doing now um, yeah. Um, yeah I would probably say um, take every opportunity um, that you're given because it might lead into something else pressure now at the end i'd say listen to these guys probably but I, th I think the main one would be yeah just keep keep plugging away i think i think that is the the main thing is you will get a lot of no's well you might not you might be lucky but you get like you will get a lot of no's i've had like no's from jobs that i've not even applied for which is just <laughs> odd but you've just got to kind of, you've got to keep going yeah i was invited in and then they said they were sorting the contract out and then said you've not got that job well, not applied for anything <laughs> Hi. Um, in the future, what do you think the future holds for the media industry and what would you like to see in the industry more in the next five years? You'd imagine there'd be some involvement with AI, don't you? You'd have thought at some stage. Um, I quite like how now you can you can kind of make you can be a content creator you can like there's so many channels to kind of put your own stuff out there i think that's a, a positive thing but then there's also like i think there needs to be some level of like kind of making sure that what is going around is still trustworthy so i'm not quite sure if that answers the question but yeah more of that um i would probably say it's probably 
um it's it's probably going to move on to like streaming platforms um particularly i'm sure if you read the news you'll know um Hollywood isn't on Channel 4 anymore. We've now moved to streaming. It's still on television in terms of E4, but it was quite big news that we lost our Channel 4 slot for, and it's been, we've had that slot for 26 years. So that was big news for us. And I think with the, with the first soap to sort of focus going online, I think all the, all, the, all, the, all the soaps in five years' time, as well as all the TV programs will move on to, streaming but that doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be less opportunities but you know if ai is <laughs> is on the rise and but you know at the it i think i read itv and the and the, the cory and emmerdale one um they're not using they're trying to <laughs> stay away from ai and using robots to write their storylines um so who knows yeah, I agree. AI is massively, massively evolving around the world. I recently did a podcast as well about AI. Um, if anyone wants to listen to it, um, it's called Pentest People Tech Bytes on Spotify. And I spoke about how AI is revolutionizing. Um, it's taking over some jobs as well. Um, yeah. I think I think in the future, things are going to be more obviously online. I think you'll see a lot more digital content mm. as it as it is ai obviously and then what i'd like to see more of is i like to see more northern representation in the media i think it's getting a lot better i think there, there are you know a lot of broadcast companies are making big efforts to be more inclusive um and hear like different accents on the radio um i'd like to see more of that but i do think we're, it, we're, we're going in the right direction with it uh, yeah, I think I'll echo the thoughts on the whole digital sort of age of it because, as I mentioned earlier, when I sort of was applying for university and getting into university, the, the print side of things was very much dying out and um, and the whole digital sort of generation was taking over. Um, I think now in, as well, just going from a sports sort of perspective on things is uh, you look at match day programmes, for example, the amount of clubs who have stopped producing a match day programme as a physical copy, especially in the Football League because they're not making any money off them. Is, is massive so uh lincoln city for example where i was they uh they took it online last year maybe this year um so there's no physical copy there and especially you think about for example the 3 p.m uh, blackout on a saturday how important that is for football clubs to survive i think there may be a bit of a fight between as, as you've probably read in the in the news there might be a bit of a fight between efl clubs um fighting to keep that in terms of they're not going to for example, make any money as a club if no one's attending their games and they're paying £10 to watch it on a streaming service. But unfortunately, in the long run, that may be the only solution. Obviously, um, throughout lockdown, the, uh, the 3 p.m. blackout got dropped and it was a massive sort of um, uprise in subscriptions, mainly because people were at home and they had nothing to do. But um, I think that the learning from that may be damaging to the smaller football clubs and the amount of clubs you've seen, unfortunately, go under or be close to going under is, is ridiculous. So I think that needs protecting from a personal opinion, um, from a media side of things in terms of making sure that the, the digital streaming side stays very much to the um, uh, reality television, for example, um, news, stuff like that, where it normally is available on your television, but obviously streaming. So I think football personally, if it is available on streaming, shouldn't get rid of the, uh, the blackout on a Saturday. It should just be them sort of games that um, we already have available, obviously, Amazon do it quite heavily, don't they, at Christmas, and they have done for the last few seasons. So um, I think that'll be the biggest sort of change in the next five years is the, the battle for the smaller clubs to be able to keep their, uh, their actual attendances up, if that makes sense. Thank you. I got a question. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Kata. Um When you were with us, even back then, you were really good at getting people to talk to you in the street, doing box box, and... To be honest, students generally hate these. So if you're able to give these guys any advice on stopping people in the street for a chat, what would it be? Um, so people will respond differently if you've got a camera or if you've got a recorder. So that's one thing I've noticed. Um, you're more likely to obviously get people to talk to you if, you've got a radio, if you're doing radio. But I think what I do is I'll... Um, Tell them my name, so I'll go, I'll do my impression of what I do. So I go, 
Oh, hi, ladies. Sorry to interrupt you. My name is Katie. I'm just from the BBC. I'm just out today getting a few opinions. Blah, 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 blah. And then, like, if you talk to them, like the people, introduce yourself. What's your name? What's my name? Like, people will just warm to you straight away. So, like, big smile. Like, don't let them know that you're nervous because they'll just tell you where to go. Like, um, I also find like there's, there'll be different areas as well. Um, so you've got to be able to pick out. Like, I know that person this week. Like, you can just tell with people, like, whether they're going to. You know, if they're on the phone, so they've got their AirPods in their heads out, it's probably just no point. But if you've got, like, a, a little group of people, people that sat down, like, they can't run away from you. So you, there's, there's just little things that you spot. And I think if you're quite – I think I'm quite a good, like, people person. Like, if, the more you talk to people, the more you connect to people, the more types of people you know, you get to know, like, what the best way to communicate with them is. So I think – to get people, if you want to do box spots, I think the best thing to do is just be really smiley. Make them feel like they're doing you a favor. But oh, I just need you to do, give me a quick 30 seconds. Like they, They'll feel like they're doing you a favor and they're helping you out. People want to help people. Like Nice people will be nice. Most people are nice. So, so I've got a, a, a quick question. You all seem to do fast-paced, reactive jobs that are kind of live. Um, how do you manage at your sort of stage in the career? How do you manage the stress and strain of that with your actual own life um, as well. So how do you manage the emotional stress or the, the busyness of it all? Um, I think it's very important to stick to your hobbies in terms of your own time, obviously, work hard, play hard, to the saying everyone says, but um, it's very true in terms of as long as like you're working hard and things are getting done, you've got to make sure that your mind is completely fresh and ultimately you don't burn yourself out. Um, for example, in my job, like I said, with traveling, like jet lag can be a massive sort of issue for everyone in that industry. So um, there's a good group of us that make sure that, although I don't look like it, we go for runs when we land in the country and um, A, it gets you out and you get to explore the place. But ultimately, it's physical exercise that obviously keeps you fit. But mentally, like doing exercise is such a, a, a mind cleanser and it's so important. Obviously, some people might not like exercise, but they'll have that thing that that is good to them. It takes their minds away from it. Like the amount of football manager I've played on aeroplanes is ridiculous. Like I took woke into the champions league and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it doesn't matter what it is, just something that distracts you from uh, once the work's done and, and you've got that own time to yourself and, and ultimately spend time with your friends and family. Again, it's, it's a bit deep, but it's so important because they're the people that care for you the most. So if there's anything on your mind you want to discuss, it might not be an easy conversation, but ultimately, they're the people who have, A, the best advice, and they'll be there for you no matter what it is. So, um, yeah, I think just being able to balance your life in terms of uh, working hard, but also taking that time away, like, the world's not going to end if if you need that extra two hours to yourself on a, on a shift or whatever, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, just make sure that you're, you're constantly in a good place, I think is my biggest bit of advice there. I um, don't read too much of the news <laughs> when I'm not working I'll just switch off there was a point when I was when I especially when I was like working in local tv and I felt like I needed to be on top of everything all the time um I was I was like managing a, a, a quite a lot of uh, tv stations across the the country so I had to be like on top of what was happening locally in so many areas and I felt like the best way to do that was to just be always listening to the news and the each like Every bulletin, every news program, radio for was constantly state. I was so miserable. <laughs> um, so I just had to cut back on the news. And I feel like that is was really good for my mental health. And so when I'm outside of work now, like if I'm not working, I'll still listen to the news where I feel like, it, you know, I need to keep up with stuff. I'll listen to the Today program or I'll catch a couple of bulletins throughout the day. But I'm not living and breathing it anymore which might sound like the opposite of what you've been told to do but I think if you just to balance that and and stay like feel like you're mentally healthy I think it's good to just to switch off for a bit like yeah, you'll always be able to catch up on it a bit like what you were saying if you, if a couple of hours off it's fine like just find a, a good balance I think between work and life thank you Eamon have you got anything to add yeah uh, making sure you're organized making sure you don't burn out like you said um Sorry, I've just lost my words. Um, yeah, scheduling all your content. I try to do two podcasts max a week. Um, I can't do any more than I can't do any more than that because a lot of work uh, goes through planning a production, and I'm, obviously I'm the only one that 
in, in my job does podcasting so it does take a lot of time a lot of hard work goes into planning an episode so making sure you're organized you've got a schedule Monday to Friday what, what you want to do and I have cons consultants people in, on LinkedIn saying oh can I come on a podcast with you and I'm like I'm sorry I'm fully booked this week we can do it next week and um, yeah so making sure you've got a schedule everyone being organized thank you yeah it is um high pressure there's lots of changes happening all the time you have to be adaptable and um but i think as soon as you get home you need to forget about <laughs> you need to forget about it and you know so you're it, not watching yeah. Eights every no, night no i, I do i do watch every night like. yes i do watch every night um um but you know just pick up at 9 a.m <laughs> um tomorrow and you know it'll it, for, you know it's you know we, we and it, you know, we always say it is a miracle how it gets on television. <laughs> you know, uh, if you know what happens behind the scenes, you'll know exactly what I mean by that. Um, because it is hectic. It is, you know, there is changes happening all the time. You know, someone could decide to go to Australia in the jungle, and we have to write you out. Um, so, <laughs> so you really need to switch off then, basically. Yeah. Don't you and have time out. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Just relax and wind. <laughs> Good old cup of tea. Otis, what do you think? Um, sport, like sport in the way I play like um, people in the office now will be watching and they'll be laughing at me because I was going about it, but play like tag rugby and they call it fake rugby. But uh, they play across the road at Yarnbury, but that used to be on at like um, eight or nine at night, but it's just 40 minutes, just turn up and like you could have the most stressful day ever, but you just go there and just switch off for an hour, run around a bit. Um, it's the same with like going to the gym. So if you like running, playing any sport or something like that just I think that just kind of clears your mind switch off you're not thinking about work also just like I think like Casey I just sometimes don't like I won't get home and think right I'm gonna get into a nice meaty article now I'll just sometimes just watch a bit of just nonsense really online I'll be scrolling through just stupid videos and spend time with your friends and stuff like that but I think when you're starting out there is like a, a you put so much pressure on yourself and there's so much stress because you think I've got to got to press on I don't know when I'll get my next opportunity and things but you've also got to like um realize there'll be times where you are just burnt out and you don't have the motivation and in those times it's all right to just kind of just do your do your job every time I was sent like a story the day before I was going um out reporting the day after when I first started I'd be stressing out about it, thinking I've got to like kind of research this I've got to start writing scripts and think about what pictures are going to be in there but then you never like ever switched off. You'd be like, from the time you finish your story, you've just done, you'd be looking at like the day after. Sometimes you have to, because it's it's quick and you've got to like there's deadlines, but it's sometimes I just think, right, I'll just switch off and I'll deal with it in the morning. And remember to take a step back. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're very proud of you and thank you all for being here and for your time. Thank you. There we go. I should know how to work a microphone, shouldn't I? Uh, right, that's it for the first half of today. It's lunchtime now. Fill your boots, and then we're back at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh